Hello, father. Yeah. Hello, ladies. Welcome to our Orlando Evening Women um, BSF class. So good to see you here. What a beautiful sunshine outside after a very dreary start. But we did in the rain. My backyard is so happy. I don't know about yours, and um, the air is clean. And I was driving here, and I'm like, Lord. I could be going anywhere in so many places, but how amazing, how special, what a blessing that we are going to Bible study and fellowship. So welcome. I hope you have the same excitement to be here. Um, and um, I know God has something really special for us tonight. I want to just give a quick announcement before I pass to um, Deborah. Uh, that we have a couple combined groups tonight. For Lucky's group is combined with Jen, uh, Jennifer Follett's group at the same area, okay? So you're on the same fellowship hall. Um, and then Joy's group is combined on room 140. It's downstairs. If you go through these doors, make a left, go all the way, make a right, it'll be uh, right there. <clears throat> on the first, uh, first floor, room 140 or also uh, called uh, the music suite. Now, Deborah, our children's supervisor, has something special to share with us. How is everybody doing tonight? This week we learned that God's compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Speaking of mornings, I had lunch with a former co-leader of mine who is in an online class, and she was telling me about their student program for the online class, and specifically about a mother in Nigeria who wakes up her two young sons to log into BSF at 2 a.m. in the morning, their time. As she explained how these tender age students sometimes struggle to remain awake during their class, I couldn't help but think of the faithful mother making sure um, they were there in front of the computer, ready to study God's word each week, despite the most severe circumstances. You see, it's more than just an inconvenience of rallying her kids um, to come to BSF. It's so much more. Nigeria is one of the Open Doors World Watch List and is ranked seven out of the top 50 countries where Christians face persecution, extreme persecution. Her country is divided roughly between half Muslims on the north side and Christians in the south. However, the Christian share of their population is on the decline. Nigeria is officially a secular state with no official state religion. However, in recent years, 12 Muslim majority northern states have incorporated Muslim laws into their legal systems, which has led to death and displacement. By doing what she's doing, this mother could face nothing but nothing short of terrorism, kidnapping, and death just for having her son study God's word. I know that's a lot to sink in, and sometimes we don't want to rock the boat when there's little resistance in our way bringing students to this um, student program. That's why I admire this woman who lives halfway around the world, because she embodies the love of Jesus that fuels a commitment to advance the cause of Christ, no matter what. That's the very definition of the BSF core value, passion for Christ. I hope this heroic yet mama bear commitment to, be, to Bible study inspires you to think who you may bring next year to the study of John to the student program. Like I note said from this lesson, we may never have a complete picture in this life of God's eternal work, but you can show the next generation how your love for Jesus fuels a deep commitment in you and you can help and you can't help but advance the cause of Christ while knowing that God loves and saves children. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. We think we know oppression. We think we know hard times, right? Until we hear stories like that. But let me just encourage you, as she did with our children, they will be the defenders of our faith one day. When we're gone, they'll be left. 
and they will be the defenders of our faith. So raising them with a foundation, a true foundation based on God's word and the truths and principles that are in there is so important. It's so important. So with that said, let's stand and we're going to sing A Mighty Fortress. And I'm going to do you a favor and turn this microphone on. Let's pray. Lord, I look at the words of that hymn that say, the word above all earthly powers. How true a statement that is, God. And as we come to your book of Lamentations tonight, God, we want to understand why this unusual book was left for us. What we can learn about you, what we can learn about our relationship with you as we study the words that Jeremiah penned tonight. God, we often have our own cries from the depths of our hearts. And so I'm thankful that you have given us the space, that you hear our cries when we do cry out and that you are working on our behalf. So God, we come to you tonight with confidence that you will expand our thinking, you will open our hearts, and then we trust that you will give us the courage to walk in the light of what you teach us tonight. I pray all of this in your powerful name. Amen. I looked at my screen and I couldn't see it. And I was like, oh, I forgot to put my glasses on. <laughs> that would not be good. Um, well, here we are, ladies, together again with another first tonight. Um, the first time the Book of Lamentations has been studied as a whole um, in BSF. And at first glance, you may be like me and wonder why God would include this interesting book in his written word. 
right? Why he preserved it for us. It's really a one-way conversation in which God doesn't respond at all, right? And in the end, none of the writer's questions or petitions are acknowledged and they're certainly not answered. Um, the book of Lamentations though is simply a lament, a heartfelt expression of grief and sorrow is expressed directly to God and its purpose is to deepen our confidence in God's grace. Today, we could, by a stretch of the imagination, look at this in a similar way like we do journaling. How many of you journal? Many of you? It can be very therapeutic, can it, to express ourselves from the human emotion that arises in us as we experience pain and suffering and even joy. Um, words, either spoken or written, help us uh, process experiences and often bring healing to our souls. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was young, and so I would visit my dad uh, in Maine almost every summer. And I remember when I was in middle school and high school, I would grab my spiral notebook and I would go down to the lake that was by my dad's house and I would just sit and write. I was one of those kids. Um, sometimes I would journal and sometimes I would dabble in a little poetry. I just remember it being a very beautiful time of reflection and stillness for me. And today, believe it or not, um, I have a drawer full of spiral notebooks that have been filled up over the years with um, thoughts and reflections and even words of um, wisdom from other people that have impacted me and I have made note of them. Um, I mean, I have just a little disclaimer. I grew up in the time where there was no cell phone and social media. So this kind of activity was very normal back then. This is how we occupied ourselves, right? I see a lot of nodding. Um, the proper expression of our feelings is good and it is healthy. Um, I was with my 18 month old granddaughter this past weekend. I often saw the frustration she had at not being able to express herself to me in a way that I could understand, or she spoke words that I had no idea what the meaning was. Um, and I couldn't quite understand her. And it dawned on me that um, being able to express ourselves in a way where we can be understood is something that we learn. We have to learn to be able to do that. And so as we come to the book of Lamentations, we see the author use human words in a very impactful way. So let's talk about the value of lament here in our first division. God knew that we were going to need a way to express the many things that rise from within us. And as people living in a fallen world, we lament when we respond to the suffering and the loss um, in and around us by putting our human pain into words. Unfortunately, pain really tempts us though sometimes to give God the silent treatment, doesn't it? But God says, talk to me about it. Even if it's messy, I don't care. So we're not told exactly who wrote the book of Lamentations, but it is widely um, accepted in theological circles that Jeremiah is the author. Because of the um, writer's personal and very vivid descriptions in the book describing the, vault, the fall of Jerusalem. And these descriptions correspond with somebody who actually lived through the catastrophe and then wrote about it when his heart was still broken or even experiencing the trauma. And so this unique book of Lamentations arises out of human anguish of one who has survived and is living to witness um, the most traumatic event in the Old, Old Testament history. You see, the fall of Jerusalem was the most horrendous, catastrophic thing in Israel's history up to this point. After 500 years of the generosity of God giving them the land and having his presence with them in the temple, the city fell to Babylon. It was literally decimated and gone. The extreme human suffering, the devastation of this beautiful ancient city, the national humiliation to their neighbors, the undermining of everything 
that was thought to be guaranteed under the Davidic covenant, the protected city Zion and the temple of God was no more. And we forget how devastating this is because believe it or not, it was way back in lesson 17. We're on lesson 27 right now when we read about the fall and the exile of God's people. So the horror of this event um, might not be very fresh in our minds, but the book of Lamentations tonight brings it even more vividly into our view. So expressing the emotions and struggles rising within us is healthy, particularly when we pour out our troubles to God. Repressing or ignoring the realities of our struggles is not helpful because we live in this world and we face all kinds of situations that bring pain and bring sorrow and bring trouble. And the reality is God knows and understands what we cannot. Therefore, when we pour our hearts out to him, it helps us find the comfort that we desperately need. Lament seeks to create a pathway to praise and it can bridge the gap between suffering and trusting in God's sovereignty. You see, pain is a terrible filter. So your feelings or your circumstances should not dictate your view of God. Healthy lament should point us to God. It's simply a prayer. It is born out of great pain that leads us though to trust God. Lament can also help us process our pain in a way that leads us to a place where we can actually rejoice. Have you ever experienced that? It's how we as believers grieve and praise God through our sorrow and our suffering. Scholars actually estimate that one third of the Psalms are laments. So lamenting represents a really normal experience for us as Christians. Now, I do want to caution us that lament does not mean that we endlessly languish in sadness without any hope. That's not what it means. It's an expression of our feelings. But as we know, our feelings are not necessarily an accurate reflection of reality, and they certainly are not an accurate reflection of what God is doing in and through our difficulties. So although it is okay to acknowledge our feelings, it's not always good to react according to our feelings. It's okay to feel your feelings. It's not okay to follow your feelings. Lament leads us to draw on what we believe, what we know to be true about God, not on what we feel, regardless of what the world tells you. So what is the purpose of lament? What does it seek to do in us? And how can we express our lament um, in a way that is healthy and that also points us to God? Well, lament invites us to go to God in prayer because human suffering always leads us to probing questions about God. What power does he have? Why does he let bad things happen? Where is he in our pain? Does he even care? Our lament should drive us to our knees because it's there that we meet our father who knows our sorrow. He felt our sorrow. He experienced our sorrow. He experienced our suffering. Have you ever found clarity um, or perspective in a problem as you've walked it out with a trusted friend? As you voiced your situation and your lack of answers, things might become clearer. It's the same when we go to God's prayer and we can never underestimate the privilege we have of having conversation with our Lord. Well, we can also with laments voice our complaints. We can bring the messy stuff and candidly tell God what's wrong because he already knows, right? But it's, really, it's relieving to express what we can't figure out or what we can't understand. And God allows us to voice that frustration as part, part of the process that seeks to take our deep disappointment and hurt and come to a place where his trustworthiness is boldly affirmed, regardless of whether your situation has changed. And once we've come to him and candidly expressed 
our anguish, we can boldly ask God, boldly ask him to remind us of who he is and what he can do. It's our invitation to trust God to do what we cannot do for ourselves. And finally, as we saw Jeremiah do so beautifully and intentionally, we're led to the place where we can choose to trust God with all our messy complaints, with our bold requests and petitions, we can choose to trust that God is in control, even when we don't feel like he is. We choose to follow what we believe to be true about the character of God and not the character of our feelings. Our situation may not change right there, but our perspective will because our posture has changed. It's, it's not healthy to fake our way through the pain. And if we do not come to God with our honest cries, then we are often led to doubt the substance of our faith. I shouldn't feel this way as a mature Christian. Have you ever said those things? What a merciful, gracious God that he would allow us such an honest and heartfelt way to bring our deepest sorrows to him through lament. So what is a principle that we can take away from seeking the value of lament? Well, there is spiritual value in healthy lament. That's our principle. There's spiritual value in healthy lament. There's spiritual value in healthy lament. Why does God allow suffering? Well, Pain and suffering push us towards dependence on our Heavenly Father, right? If he rescued us from every bit of suffering on earth, how would this life be different from heaven where he promises to wipe away every tear? How would we grow in faith and maturity? How would we learn the character of God? We all experience suffering in this world. Jesus even promised it when he told us that in this life, we will face troubles. And yet, out of our suffering and troubles, God will establish us deeper in truth and deeper in relationship with him if we allow it. The pain often makes us desperate for answers, doesn't it? As if answers would somehow make it better or relieve the deep ache that we feel? Why do we fool ourselves in thinking, if I can understand why this happened, maybe, maybe I can accept it. What we need way more than understanding is Jesus's presence and his comfort. And that's what he's promised. When our pain and our sorrow go deep, God's love goes deeper. When we cry out to God, when we lament, the honest anguish of our suffering, we are allowing God to align our hearts with the truth of who he is, of who he says that he is, not our circumstances. So let's look at Jeremiah's lament in the five poems that make up the book of Lamentations. And if you haven't already, would you open your Bible with me? Because we're gonna read a few verses together out loud. So you'll need to have those open. Um, they say that what makes a person cry says a lot about the person, whether or not they're self-centered or God-centered. And the book of Lamentations, I think, shows us what made Jeremiah sorrowful, didn't it? Suffering can't be soothed away by pretending that it doesn't exist or that it will just magically go away with time. And we see that in the intensity in which Jeremiah poured out his grief to God in these chapters. Now, keep in mind, Jeremiah had prophesied all that would come to pass on God's people as judgment for their sin. Um, but seeing it and living it and experiencing it bring the intensity and the reality of it to a whole different level, doesn't it? Jeremiah opens the book grieving and mourning the utter destruction of Jerusalem and she, as we see here in the beginning, uh, refers to the city of Jerusalem. And we see him describe her um, as a widow who has lost her reason for living. Perhaps the most chilling words are found um, in, in verse nine, where he says, her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding. There was none to comfort her. 
Clearly, Jeremiah connected Jerusalem's sins with her destruction. And the people are gone, and those that are left, we see, are struggling to survive. And the city's been ransacked, and it's been destroyed of all of its splendor. Verses 12 through 22 then shift to the lament of Jerusalem as the city here is personified as speaking to those who are passing by. And she's pleading that God would regard her misery and judge those who harmed her. And as we begin in chapter two, God's wrath is detailed and revealed. And we see it reflected in phrases like, the Lord has covered daughter Zion with the cloud of his anger in verse one. He has poured out his wrath like fire, verse four. The Lord is like an enemy, verse five. He has destroyed his place of meeting in six. The Lord has rejected his altar. What's important to remember in harsh phrases like these that do reflect the truth of God's judgment that he brought is that God's wrath is a display of his righteousness and love. And they emanate from his love and his compassion and his desire to curb the sin of his children. Jeremiah knew his people's suffering was the justified consequences of their sin, and it caused him great sorrow, as we see reflected in verses 11 through 19. From 11, he says, my eyes fail from weeping. In 17, the Lord had done what he planned. And Jeremiah closes out chapter two with an invitation in 19 for his people to call on God. And in verse 20, he pleaded with God for the suffering to cease. Jerusalem's discipline truly, truly was painful. It was painful to experience and it was painful to watch. As we come to chapter three, it's the longest chapter in Lamentations and it's also um, the most beautiful, and many consider it one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible as it relates to expression and personal pain and hurt, as well as confidence and trust in God. And we see the depth and expression of loss and disappointment is only matched by Jeremiah's trust in the Lord's faithfulness and love. He's speaking personally here as he's referring to himself when he uses the word I and me and my. And he's referring to God when he uses a secondary program, pronoun of he. His pain and agony are captured in phrases like, I am the man who has seen affliction, from verse one. Made to walk in darkness rather than light, from two. The loss of freedom through imprisonment, violent treatment, mangled and left without help. Becoming a laughingstock in 14, embittered, despondently mournful. Probably the saddest of all is verse 17 and 18, the loss of his joy and his peace. These expressions are hard to read from God's faithful prophet, but they are the honest cry of his heart. But as we get to verse 21, we see him shift from his distress to his hope. We see him find hope in God's love and his faithfulness, causing him to resign himself willfully and intentionally to the will and to the plans of, of God. And so would you read out loud with me from chapter three, verses 21 through 23? Yeah, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Jeremiah shifted his thoughts to God's enduring love and great faithfulness. He knew God's compassion allowed his very own survival right then and there. He recognized that God provided fresh expressions of his favor with every new morning. And he firmly placed his hope in God and quietly waited on him for deliverance and for salvation. Jeremiah shows us here how to acknowledge our pain and suffering while also experiencing God's enduring faithfulness. Can you mourn and pray at the same time? Yeah, you can. Can you trust God and grieve losses at the same time? Yeah. Can God be trusted with what he has not yet resolved? Yes, he can. 
And Jeremiah showed us how to do that by intentionally setting his mind on what he knew to be true about God and what he knew to be true about God's character. We cannot measure God's faithfulness and goodness by the circumstances that cause us grief. You see, Jeremiah chose to trust God despite the circumstances raging all around him. And even as God brings judgment and allows pain, he longs to compassionately draw his people to himself. He doesn't delight in afflicting um, people. And this thought is encouraging because as we can rest in God's tenderness and loving heart, no matter what the circumstances we face, because of his sovereignty, God works mightily through both good things and bad, and he can be trusted even in situations that you and I cannot understand or find meaning. Jeremiah continued in chapter three to call the people to examine their ways and return to the Lord to find forgiveness. He acknowledged the terror and grief that the judgment inflicted on God's people. And he cried out to God, knowing that God saw the agony and the torment brought on by their enemies. He prayed that God would bring rightful justice to those who had so harmed his people. And then Jeremiah intentionally trusted God in his infliction and beautifully confessed God's unfailing present, presence and purposes at the end of chapter three, even though his circumstances remained. Intentional focus on God, his unchanging character and specific attributes helps us put our troubles into perspective. God can use prayer, he can use scripture, worship, hymns, fellowship, our circumstances, anything to speak to our hearts and call us to himself. And at our lowest point, we can give God the costliest gift we have to offer, worship from a broken heart. Have you ever been there? When we go home to heaven someday, we will worship Jesus forever. He will wipe away every tear, but here on earth, we can praise him in the middle of pain and in the middle of loss, and he honors and delights in worship from a broken heart, a heart that declares, even now, God, even in this, you are good. Chapter four gives us a vis vivid and more factual account of life in the city since the siege, describing uh, the effects of the destruction. Verse one, the fine gold became dull. And the destruction of the people in verses four through 10, he said, those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. Can you even imagine the horror? God has given full vent to his wrath. He's poured out his fierce anger, we see in verse 11. There were some hard things to read uh, in this chapter, but it helps us to really realize how terrible things were when Jerusalem fell. Every layer of society was affected. And Jeremiah did not shy away from voicing the extreme suffering of his people before God. And now in chapter five, we see this faithful prophet praying for God's mercy and petitioning God for restoration, a passionate prayer on the behalf of God's people. He acknowledged the awfulness of what he faced with the certainty of who God is. Jeremiah identified with the people as he prayed for them. He said, remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace from verse one. He recounted their current state, fatherless, widowed, slaves, violated, broken down, breakdown of order, child labor, desolation of the temple, no music, no joy. Their dancing had turned to mourning. And finally, Jeremiah yields to God's higher ways in verses 21 through 22. He says, restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. The end. Seriously, Lamentations ends, right? <laughs> no response or reaction from God. And yet Jeremiah, I believe, had the assurance that God saw him and that God heard him because he had declared this truth already in verse uh, 57 of chapter three. He said, 
You came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. So that's what Jeremiah did. So what truth can we take away from Jeremiah's honest, honest and anguished lament? Well, God understands our cries of lament. That's our principle. God understands our cries of lament. Jeremiah trusted that even in his brokenness and the brokenness of his people, that he could still trust God's plan. The book ends simply with a praying Jeremiah and a faithful God who could be trusted no matter what happened. Jeremiah was committed to waiting on God for what he had promised, but had not yet come to pass. Sometimes in times of deep pain and suffering, we forget that our faith is not our faith. Our faith is in his faithfulness. Suffering can't be soothed by pretending that it doesn't exist. And when we embrace joy without wrestling with tough questions, it can feel fake sometimes. Jeremiah took his grief to God in vibrant detail, as we've seen, and God heard him and God understood him. Just because we don't see a response from God recorded here in Lamentations does not mean that while Jeremiah was waiting, God was not busy restoring. It's not uncommon in the pain and hurt of our suffering to think that God is punishing us. But we must remember that God's actions are never punitive as it relates to us, his children. It's either remedial to correct behave, misbehavior or destructive patterns, or it's instructive to help us know how to live good in bad times. We have to trust that God never acts ultimately to hurt us. So as we close tonight, um, the deep theological truths of Lamentations can't be ignored. This book vividly reminds us um, that the wickedness of any people will eventually result in the disintegration of that society. And we are challenged to consider the little things in our lives that can grow into big things if we don't put them to death. Jerusalem didn't fall in one day when Babylon conquered them. It took years, years, hundreds of years of sliding into secularism for this city to reach the point of total destruction. Israel's belief was that as long as they thought they were okay, then God would be good with it. However, what God thinks is okay is a life that's lived according to his purposes and under his rule and under his reign. We're told to walk in the light of his word and God fulfills his word every bit of it. You can take that to the bank. If he has proclaimed it, it will come to pass. So let's search his word, cling to its truths, and seek diligently to live out these truths in our lives to the glory of his great name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take the truths and the principles and the applications of this book of Lamentations and give us the courage to walk it out in our own lives. May we trust you in all things, I pray in your name. Amen.